And three, two, one. What is going on, everybody? It's your boy, the Lo-Fi Horror Guy. Welcome to another episode of the Lo-Fi Horror Guys Growing On You Live. Today, I'm going to have on the one and only Gabrielle Stone. She is very busy recently with writing books. She is a director, writer, actress. She's been in numerous movies. Um, as far as directing wise, you know, she's stepped into that role with uh, After Emma. It happened again last night. Stay Home, which uh, came out this last year, uh, starring tons of really, really cool people in the horror community. We're going to dig into all of this stuff and much more. Uh, <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm good. How are you, dude? I, I am good. Thank you so much, and good morning. I uh, sometimes the time difference kind of kind of messes with me, and I forget about that. I apologize. It's so early. Yeah, you know, I was like, oh, do I really have to get makeup on at eight a.m.? <laughs> here we are <laughs> <laughs> no that's fun that's fun i appreciate it first and foremost thank you so much for your time uh you've been really busy this last couple of years have you've had a lot of projects coming out yeah it's been weird especially in 2020 i was like oddly busy which seems like an oxymoron but i was so grateful to have stuff that i was doing at home and it, it allowed us to get uh creative in some weird different ways Sure. Yeah. You know, and that's one of those things too. I see, you know, as far as with, with 2020, you know, it being such a hot mess that it was, uh, but you know, a lot of people really took advantage of, you know, the spare time that maybe they didn't have before and, you know, took up some writing, took up some projects that they may have not, you know, been able to, uh, you know, take, take on. So, I mean, that's really, really cool. And, uh, and you stayed very busy with it, still doing a lot of writing. I see you traveling and writing. Yeah, you know, we obviously like we were traveling safely. So we would go camping and and places that we knew were, you know, confined and safe that we could drive to um, that we didn't have to be around anybody when we got there. Um, and at first, you know, during the pandemic, it was I everybody all of my readers um, were like, Oh, are you writing book two? Like, come on, let's go. You should have all this time. And it was really hard at first to like, I, I didn't want to do anything. I, I was just <laughs> right. feeling like the collective consciousness and the weight of the heaviness of what's going on in the world. And I wasn't like in a creative space. And that was really hard for me, especially because I'm so driven that I was like, oh, I have all this time. I should be doing all this stuff. But it was tough the first couple months. And then finally it like, passed that first initial wave. And I, I was able to start getting back to some good work. Yeah, sure. And I mean, that's one of those things, too, you know, as far as like not pressuring it, you know, something yeah. that, you know, with your first book you had, you know, like such a great thing. And, and it's still fairly new, too. So that's kind of one of those things sometimes where it's like, hey, man, let's just enjoy this for a second and right. not press, you know, try to push me into some other shit now, too. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a catch 22 because I so I love that because it means everybody that's reading it is like, oh, my God, we need a second one. Once but more. yeah, you're totally right. I'm like, OK, but let's just like enjoy this ride for like two years and then maybe we'll talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, look, so I'm, I'm growing on you live. Basically, I have two fun, you know, kind of silly icebreaker questions for you. Initially, the remainder of the interview is about you and your craft, you know, all of the different things that you've taken on in the in the film industry and now writing. And then I have one finale that I wrote just for you. And uh, so if, if you're all set, we're gonna dig right into it. Um, hey, let's do it. Sick. All right. First of all, my wife and I do some traveling. So if we were coming through LA or somewhere, you know, local to you, and I'll even say pre or post COVID. What would be a local restaurant that you would say we would have to stop by and try before we left? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, in LA, God, there's so many places in LA. Um, and there's like the small ones that are like hidden in a corner that nobody really knows about. And then there's like the more bougie, you know, sit down, nice restaurants. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of our personal favorites that we go to, and it's kind of like, it's totally hidden. I found out about it um, like two years ago when I went and met a director there for lunch and it's called Scaffs. It's this little um, Middle Eastern joint that's literally in a strip mall. Um, it's, it's maybe a mile and a half from where I live and uh, it's just so good. It's like super, super like you just like go in and sit down and it's very casual. It's not fancy at all. Uh, but I've, almost every time I've gone in there, I've seen someone I've recognized because it's like a, a known little gem secret of North Hollywood. So that would be oh, my okay. <laughs> Is there something that's like a go-to when you go there that you don't even have to look at the menu for? Yeah, I always do like the, the two chicken kebabs with their cabbage salad and pita and 
hummus and it's oh, so good. We had it the other nice. night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice, nice. That's awesome. All right. Now, next up, I wanted to ask, you know, if, if you were able to, you know, if you and I were making a horror movie and I said, Gabrielle, I need you to come up with the villain for this horror movie, wh whether it be a, a giant monster, a, a gross insect, a serial killer, a werewolf, what type of a villain would you put for a horror movie we were making? You know, I've always been more terrified of stuff that's based in reality. Um, I can watch freaking ghost stories until the cows come home. Um, and, it, <laughs> you know, I, I can appreciate them, but it doesn't really, like, get under my skin. But shit that can really happen. <laughs> um, like, the strangers scared the hell out of me because it's like that can happen. You know, when she's, like, freaking mm -hmm. out why are you doing this? He's like, because you were home. It's like, oh my God, I was home. Yeah. <laughs> it's stuff like that that like really is terrifying. So I would do like some type of psychotic serial killer for sure. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's funny. I mean, you mentioned that too, because that is one of the, that's one of those movies that even with it being newer still sticks out to be one of the scariest movies that is around. Just, you know, especially if you have a house that's in the middle of the woods and you're watching that, you're just like, oh my God. Now you yeah. have to move. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your introduction to the film industry and becoming an actress. How did that all start for you? Um, so I kind of grew up on a film set. You know, my mom obviously is, is Dee Wallace um, from E.T. and the, uh, the Howling and Cujo. My dad was also an actor. He was also in Cujo and the Howling and did a bunch of TV. Um, so I kind of grew up on set it was what I knew I think um they were shooting the new Lassie when I was born and I was like you know months old on that set um so I kind of just always knew the film industry um I remember when we went to New Zealand my mom was shooting the Frighteners with Peter Jackson and um I was like playing Foursquare with Michael J Fox on set um and he was <laughs> the most oh awesome God. man ever and you know, that was my first experience of kind of like being on set of a horror film. Um, I remember my mom was shooting the beginning part of it where she's like running through the house screaming and he's chasing her. Um, and so she's bleeding and I walked onto set and she, she brought me over and she's like, okay, I want you to lick mommy's arm. It's just corn syrup. <laughs> um, and so it, it really just kind of, it was part of my life at that point, you know, I, I really just sorry if you can hear my dogs there. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it was part of my life. So I think when I transitioned into wanting to be an actress, it really, I already felt comfortable with it. You know what I mean? It was already kind of like my second home. Uh, yeah. So it just made a lot of sense when I decided to make that transition, which wasn't until I was 18. You know, I waited a while to really like, have a normal childhood, which I was really grateful that I did. Okay. Okay. And I mean, was it more of your choice as far as like wanting to wait a little while and to get into that and just kind of enjoy life and do other things? Yeah. I think my mom has always supported me no matter what I wanted to do. It was like, if you want to be an actress, be an actress. If you want to, you know, play sports or dance or gymnastics, it was whatever I wanted to do that was making me happy. She was supportive of. I don't think she was like, at three years old, like get in front of a camera. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's obviously not the the easiest career path to take, and that you definitely um, you definitely get a lot of rejection, and it's not the easiest of uh, of paths, if you will. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Did you take like theater classes or anything when you were in school? I did. Um, I took uh, musical theater in seventh and eighth grade middle school, and we did like stage shows. Um, and I ended up taking acting class outside of school um, with her, actually, because she had one of the biggest acting studios in L.A. So when I turned 16, I started taking her class. And she was very – she's from Kansas, so I, I grew up in a house where, like, I never heard her drop an F-bomb or curse, really. And the second I got into that acting class, you know, someone was not able to get there in a scene. And she just, I mean, strung like five cuss words together. Like, <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That is hilarious. Wow. Uh, and, and I mean, it's funny, you know, as far as like with actually taking on that, that career path too, and having some of those classes, like, it's different than having, you know, like a math class, and then, you know, just like going past, you know, school and being like, well, that didn't help me at all. I don't even know why I took that. But do you have certain things from those like theater classes that 
you still, you know, that, that are still, you know, relevant in your mind? Um, not specific things from like that long ago, but it definitely helped me get out of my comfort zone. Um, I remember, okay. you know, being able eventually to just like hop up on stage and do an improv or um, be really comfortable in front of a group of people that were watching me. So stuff like that, I've definitely taken with me throughout different aspects of my life, not only just in acting. Okay. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, bring us back to some of your first acting gigs and just maybe something that you would learn from those that you carry with you now. Um, my first acting job was in a, well, I mean, I did like little stuff here and there, but this is what I consider my first um, acting job. I was 18 and it was a short film called Henry John and the Little Bug. And I'm still good friends with the director. Um, we're, we're, developing a project together now actually that's a feature and um it it was definitely my first introduction into like being the lead of something on a film set um and i remember walking off that set being like oh okay i don't want to go back to school and i don't want to do anything else ever again <laughs> <laughs> right okay nice yeah so that, that just kind of started it all for you yeah and it, it you know there's like there's something that's so fun about being on a set and getting able to like play pretend you know like it's it's mm -hmm. what I always loved as a child doing so it was kind of like oh I get to do this in my adult life great <laughs> <laughs> right okay now I mean you had mentioned your your mom as far as you know the, the the acting and all of the great roles and just for so long you know being so relevant uh even still today being a relevant actress in and out of horror uh, who were some other, you know, females when you were growing up and, and start, you know, starting to decide on being an actress that, you know, really inspired you? Um, I was always a really big fan and still am of Nicole Kidman. I was oh, yeah. obsessed with Moulin Rouge uh, growing up. <laughs> um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that movie <laughs> from it, <laughs> but it was one of my favorites. And I think she's fantastic in like everything she does. Um, we uh, we just binge watched at the beginning of quarantine, um, both seasons of Big Little Lies. And the second season between her and Meryl Streep is just some of the highest like class acting you can watch. You know, it's just like watching a master class on the craft. And um, yeah. I just think she's Thing. Um, so people like that. Uh, Ellen Bernstein is a big one. She oh, um, yeah. for a dream is high on my list, and I think her performance in that is like legendary. Um, so, and I mean, of course, my mom. You know, like I, I grew up watching her on set. So anything that she was in or doing, um, or people that were working closely with her, was uh, was mm -hmm. a big thing. Okay, yeah, I, and, and she'd probably kill you if you didn't say so. So good call. <laughs> <laughs> that so <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that, that's that's funny and i mean obviously like i say and still relevant today you know she is absolutely huge and just one of one of the greatest so uh that's that's a great inspiration to have <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so now you got into into film initially acting and then expanding you know to different aspects you know tell us just about as far as you know what brought the change to taking on different roles with writing and directing and um, so it actually happened when I was booked on a really big horror film and uh, was getting ready to leave town for uh, three and a half weeks. And two days before we were getting on the plane, their funding fell through. So, oh. like, first of all, I was devastated because it was going to be like this, like, big, you know, kind of jump in my career. But I also was like, well, shit, I have three and a half weeks of my life booked out. Like, what am I going to do? And it was kind of then that I was like, well, I don't want to stand around waiting for auditions and waiting for jobs to come in. And I was like, well, I'm just going to write something for myself. Um, so I partnered with Rose, who I had worked with. Um, he was my director on Speak No Evil, which was um, the Lionsgate film that I had done. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it really became this like collaborative process of like, what story do I want to tell? Um, I originally wasn't going to play the lead in it. I wanted to play the girlfriend. Um, and when we had finished finally getting the script to where we wanted it, he looked at me and he's like, you know, you have to play the lead, right? I was like, Ugh, okay. Um, looking back, <laughs> so happy that I did because um, I ended up, I think we got, 
we got a ton of awards for that film on the circuit, but I think I won four Best Actress awards, and it was like a really kind of like new path into my career for getting like yeah. weapons work which was really great but um that was the first film i directed so we co-directed it so i was producing i was co uh, co-directing and i was also in every scene in front of camera um so it was a lot it was a lot of work um and we shot it in two days and it was my first really time behind camera and like i totally fell in love with it because i was able to have more control over what was happening normally as an actress you show up you do your job and you're like cool well I hope it looks good I hope it turns out okay um and I obviously grew up on a lot of indie sets being like why are we doing this like this and shouldn't we <laughs> move the camera here like okay okay I'll just I'll be here okay great um so <laughs> it really gave me that sense of like oh I can control this a little more and I can plan things and I can I, I'm I'm a producer in my regular life. Like I, you know, I love to to make things the best that it can be. Um, and directing really gave me that opportunity to do that. Um, so it was okay. one of the best, best happy accidents that could have happened, me losing uh, that job to be able to stay at home and like decide to dabble in directing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. Now, and tell us about how, uh... Uh, a bet turned into the project uh, as far as after Emma? How did, yeah. how did that happen? <laughs> so after Emma was my second um, film that I directed. I wrote and directed it by myself this time. Um, and it stars, my mom has a role in it. Uh, it stars Amy Smart and Tay Morgazi. And Tay and I are, he's my boyfriend. And um, we, <laughs> so long ago now, it must have been two years ago, um, we went to Lake Arrowhead um, just for like a little weekend getaway and he was cooking dinner and I was drinking wine and um, he had, he had bet me on something. I don't even remember what the bet was. It was something stupid. And he was like, if you lose, which I never do. So this was like meant to happen. <laughs> uh, that's with him. Let me preface that I lose all the time, but I never, I never lose bets with him. Um, he was like, if you, lose, you have to write me a short film. To like act in. I was like, okay. So I lost and sat down, was like a solid three fourths of a bottle of wine in. And during the hour he was cooking dinner, wrote After Emma. And oh, wow. We didn't like go through rewrites. It didn't really change. Like it just kind of came out. Um, and he sat down and read it and was like, okay, first of all, how did you an hour drunk? Second of all, <laughs> Second of all, this is like really good um, and we have to do this. And I wasn't even that gung ho on it. I didn't want to do another short. Like it shorts are weird because it's like, where is it really going to go? It's going to go to festivals and like, you know, you may win some awards and like, it'll be on your demo reel. But like, I'm always thinking like long-term goal. So I'm like, I'd rather do a feature, but we took it out to a couple of, um, of investors that had put in money for my first short and everybody was like oh my god let's do it we ended up getting amy smart to play his wife in it which is insane she hasn't Huge. done a in like two decades mm -hmm. um and it was a really amazing experience um it was a short but like we had 60 people on that crew it was a i mean it was a huge production and like we really like shot a mini film um and it was a really great experience for me because i not only was directing on my own, it was like fully my production. Like I put the whole crew together, I had my whole team in place and like it really was um, what solidified the fact that I do want to move forward as a as a director. Um, mm -hmm. and it opened up this whole new like level of worth for me and like it took a lot of the pressure off of me because as an actress, it's always like book a job, book a job, book a job. If you don't book a job, you're broke and you're not working. Um, <laughs> and you can only book a job when your reps are giving you auditions. So it's like this kind of like fucked up circle where you're like, I, I want to be working all the time, but like I have to wait, but what am I, what? And like, you're going in and competing against hundreds of different people. Um, so the second I stepped into directing, I was like, oh, I can write stuff and then I can actually go and make it and be almost even more fulfilled from, from that right. point process than I am as an actress um 
and it gave me this whole new, you know, area to walk into where I wasn't just like constantly wanting and needing to book a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, and it's funny, too, because you mentioned as far as like with shorts, I feel like for the longest time, that was one of those things where it was just like, yeah, I don't know if I want to waste my time. But I feel like it's kind of picking up with a lot of people really noticing people's work through shorts and, you know, producers and different people, you know, reaching out and be like, hey, I love this. Let's make this into a feature. Yeah, I think if it's done the right way, um, I didn't go into shooting after Emma being like, oh, I could make this a feature one day. I went in saying like, I have two names in this film. I know how amazing Tay is going to be. Um, and I know that it's going to be a really good calling card for me to do a feature. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, it happened again last night. We, we went to festivals and that was my first experience at festivals. And I had no idea what to expect. And we ended up picking up like 16 awards and like 25 nominations. Like it was wildly yeah. successful for a short film that, <laughs> I had never done before. Um, but it it also that it happened again last night opened a bunch of doors for me as as an actress yeah. as you know, because um, I was I was getting noticed at that point. So it, it really did everything you can hope that a short film really does. Yeah, okay, nice. And I mean, so and as far as with shorts, you know, I have to mention one more with uh, last year's Stay Home, which you co wrote with Chris Heck. And yeah was fucking awesome <laughs> first of all i absolutely loved it that, that that was so so sweet how did that come about uh so like i said i, I was done with shorts okay <laughs> right, right wrapped after emma and it was me my dp and my line producer who were like my my family team that i'll never work without um we we st we stood on set and they looked at me and they were like this has been amazing but like this sucks that it was only two days um like <laughs> next time we're doing a feature and we were like yeah no more shorts we're done then 2020 hit and covid hit and i got a call like three months in from my mom and she was like i have this idea let's make something and i was just so not creative and i was like oh my god i don't want to no no um and she like <laughs> pitched me like you know this whole what if we're all at home shoot our own stuff and i was like mom that's the worst like that's gonna look horrible and <laughs> no and um i after like an hour of talking to her i was like, look i will call chris heck He's the only person that I would ever do something like this with, but he's not going to say yes. Like we're, we're doing it for no money. Like he's not, whatever I'll call. So I call him. And of course this mother is like, <laughs> oh, dude, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. And I was like, Oh, okay. So I totally got like back roped into that. I'm happy that I did because obviously it turned out so awesome, but, um, yeah. So Chris and I flushed out the idea and we wrote the script and um, it was actually a really fun writing process because he kind of did the first pass and got all the content down. And um, I know all of the people personally that we, we ended up having in it, like Scout Compton, Daniel Harris, Kane Hodder, Barbara Crampton, my mom, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. So I got to go back in and write all of the dialogue um which is why i think it ended up sounding so natural first of all scout and i are like the same person like if you cast her you can probably cast me and it's interchangeable we just played <laughs> sisters in a film um and uh so it was like really getting to write for these people that i knew which was really fun and um and then we we shot it uh over a couple days we um barbara and uh, and kane stuff they shot themselves so we literally sent them oh, tutorials wow. on like, this is where to put the camera. This is what we need you to do. Like, make sure it's looking like this. They shot all them, uh, all the stuff themselves um, <laughs> and sent us the footage. And then for Scout, she came to where we were at my house, um, did everything social distanced and like really safe. Um, we went to Danielle's place to shoot her, but again, like social distance style. Um, and obviously my mom's and it really was made in the edit. So this is where I have to like say Chris Heck is, I mean, I take everything to him. We laugh about it because he'll do like my pitch videos and like my pitch decks for stuff that are like 
pink and purple and like rock <laughs> so like not like that um and I'll, I'll do photo shoots with him all the time because he's a fantastic photographer and they're all like pretty and like bright and I'm like sorry dude I'll eventually let you do something that's like horror and this was that um so we ended up you know getting to work with all these horror icons and it was so much fun everybody was so amazing scout specifically is just like she's such an underrated actress like it's she's so incredible um, and uh the film was really made in the edit like i don't envy chris hack for what he had to go through um <laughs> he, he would send me photos of the timeline and he's like what even is this like this is <laughs> Um, because those movies all exist on desktops and on computers. It's like there's 50 million things going on. It's not just like, oh, this shot cuts in with this shot. It's like really intricate. Um, and it, it ended up turning out really great. He did a fantastic job with it in post. And um, and all the horror community like totally loved it. And we, we kind of just did it for them. You know, we... We knew what a hard time everybody was going through with COVID and we really wanted to make it like an ode to the horror fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I saw, I think it was posted on Fangoria and I started looking through, uh, you know, just watching it, you know, initially and I see, okay, like you have Scout and then you have, you know, this person pop up and this person, I'm like, how many fucking people are in this movie? Yeah. <laughs> like, holy shit, how did this even happen? This is crazy. So well, it, is, ha it happens when Dee Wallace calls you and he's, she's like, hey, we're, we're doing horror. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. You're going you're gonna to be there. Get your ass there. Yeah. So you mentioned Kane and, and Daniel and everybody doing their own stuff and Barbara as far as how, how did the, the whole process with Kane go as far as like the fire and was, was that in his backyard? Okay. So yeah, we, again, Chris Heck's brain, um, because when he sent me the script, I'm like, okay. I mean, I know Chris, so I knew that we weren't going to actually be lighting people on fire. Um, <laughs> but there were so many stunts in it. I don't even know how we got it approved by SAG because it was in the middle of a pandemic. But And they didn't ask. They weren't like, how are you doing this? How are you breaking through windows? Um, but we weren't you know, obviously doing everything. Um, it was all movie magic. So mm -hmm. Kane um, is actually, well, okay. The shot of Kane in the backyard is actually my boyfriend, Tay, who's the only person that could double for Kane. Um, oh, shit. 6'3 and a really big dude. So we put him in like the same outfit and he was walking into our backyard, which at the time was like this dirt patch because we had just uh, moved in there. Um, and the fire is is all CGI. We just spent a lot of time making sure that it looked like actual fire. Uh, <laughs> oh, shit. Well. Um, uh, I don't want to give, you know, the film away if people haven't seen it, but there's a right. part where someone flies out of a window. Um, that was actually me in the outfit of uh of of our character at the time oh um, my god no shit we do it with um like throwing plastic plastic shards into into the frame um and it really like the way that the camera work goes makes it look like the, the characters flying out of a window um so it was all like movie magic stuff that chris is really creative and how he he knows how to do things um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are times, you know, cause we were shooting in a pandemic. So like the time that the killer is, is stalking, um, scout, that's me. <laughs> oh my God. That is fuck. I didn't know that. that like, are you in the credits? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> oh, I was to say, I don't remember seeing that. <laughs> Damn. Um, but it's like, we, we were working with what we had. So it was like, okay, well we can't bring, you know, so-and-so to this location because it's COVID. So, Gabrielle, I guess you're dressing up. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and now the, the whole short was riddled with different Easter eggs. And I mean, without spoiling anything, uh, you know, can, can you maybe tell us a couple of things that might have been ingredients from yourself? Yeah, um, there's so many. And we, we tried to do that because we knew that this was for the horror fans and we wanted them to, like, recognize that. Um, so there's... I mean, there's personal Easter eggs, like the first second that Kane pops up on the screen, he's reading my book. Yeah, um, right, right. Cause, and, you know, it's, it's hysterical because he's this big, burly, giant man. Reading <laughs> right. Funny, you know, rom-com. Um, and 
you know, there's little things like when when Scout calls the police, um, the address she gives is Laurie Strode's address in Halloween. Um, obviously, there's there's Cujo references um, mm -hmm. when the mom picks up the baseball bat. Um, there, she says an exact line from right. Cujo during that whole <laughs> whole debacle. Um, yeah, so there's tons. It's I mean, there's tons of them throughout the whole thing, and even like on the desktop, there's there's text messages um, that are from you know certain horror people and <laughs> little like tiny. It's it's you could watch it ten times and probably not see all of them. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. I, and I I mean that's probably close to what I did because you know it was like it was kind of one of those things where or I would just rewind it and be like. All right, I I feel like I I, I recognize you know the, maybe this address or this line that somebody said, and you go up and look, and you're like, oh, all right, see what you <laughs> did there, <laughs> nice. Uh, and the one last thing with that, you got to tell us about where did it come from to have Kane and Daniel Harris watching The Bachelor? You know, what is I, this story? <laughs> not like a good answer for that. I I remember the first version of the script that I read, Chris had written it, and I was like. Oh. <laughs> fucking hysterical um especially because i'm full <laughs> that like that's my trashy reality too. Ugh, my wife too it's yeah it's just like you know it is what it is um, right. but yeah. it, it, again it's like the juxtaposition of seeing kate hotter who's this giant you know man knowing for ripping people to shreds being <laughs> yeah we were supposed to watch the bachelor on tivo she never called um, <laughs> right. i think we needed to kind of splice in some comedic moments. Um, and that was one that ended up being golden. <laughs> yeah, it, it absolutely worked. And it's one of those, like I say, my, my wife loves that show. And if I'm home on whatever night that it's on, I have to watch it too. And oh. so, but you know, I watched it in the, 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 the short and I'm like, you have to see this. This is fucking ridiculous, but <laughs> it was great. Very memorable. I loved it. Uh, um, and then so as far as like your interest in horror movies just in general I just wanted to ask you know over the years do you have maybe three scenes from horror movies or even outside of horror that have just forever been ingrained in your brain whether they were you know shocking scary maybe even heartbreaking three yeah. scenes three scenes um, okay well definitely like we talked about earlier that one from strangers um, when she's like, why are you doing this to us? And like the girl in the mask is just like, because you were home. Um, just, uh Effective. Like, <laughs> really did it for me because that can happen to anyone anywhere and that's freaking terrifying to me. Um, for sure, Cujo, um, that movie I didn't see until I was 16 um, oh, for no. obvious reasons. And, um, <laughs> and when she picks up the bat, outside the car and she's like well come on then <laughs> oh my mom is a badass <laughs> <Right>. nice, nice. <laughs> um, so that one always really stuck out to me and then um i really really this isn't horror but the movie what dreams may come with robin williams is like one of my all-time favorites oh yeah um, and the it, i guess it's not a necessarily a particular scene um but the overall way that they well there's two parts in this now that i'm talking about it the overall way that they portray heaven in mm -hmm. that film is so beautiful to me that whenever it's on screen it just that always really stuck with me um mm -hmm. and the part where he goes down to to hell um to get his wife and that whole monologue he does about like being sorry he couldn't like save her is just, oh yes that yes. whole stuck with me though to be I, <laughs> I i agree you know and it was, some, it was something always with like and i feel like even just co comedic actors in general but especially like robin williams for instance Anytime seeing him sad, anytime seeing him upset just from all the joy that he's brought over the years, and then you see him, like, hurt, oh, my yeah. God. It's, like, personal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, my God, why? Totally. And there's something about his face that even when he was, like, happy or, like, had some, like, emotion in his eyes, it just did something to my soul. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know... Anytime he does anything, it, it it affects me. But that one specifically stuck. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, beautiful. I, I love those answers. There, those are all really, really good, and 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 all super effective too. So those uh, those work very well. Uh, now, in 2019, you released your book Eat, Pray, FML. 
Uh, you know, and basically just kind of once getting off that initial flight, tell us about what were things that were kind of, you know, that were comforting to you in a foreign land and foreign situation? Um, yeah. So for the people watching that don't know, um, I was married for almost two years, found out my husband was having an affair with a 19 year old for six months, filed for divorce, left, fell madly in love with this other man, invited me on a trip to Europe, broke up with me. 48 hours before we were getting on the plane and I decided to take the trip by myself. So getting off the plane, I was lucky because our initial flight was to London and then we were supposed to connect and go on to Rome. Um, and one of my best friends from high school lives in London. So I had like a kind of starting home base where mm -hmm. I was like, you know, at least had the comfort of a friend being there. Um, but I was going off and adventuring all day on my own and it really was the being in the uncomfortableness that where I found my comfort. Because I remember that first day walking around by myself, I, I was so liberated that I had chosen to get on the plane and go. Mm -hmm. um, zero plans, which is so unlike me. Um, and I remember walking around being like, oh, my God, I'm a badass. Like, I'm here. And I did <laughs> Yeah, right, right. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but I'm doing it. Um, so I think it was finding the comfort in the uncomfortable that that really brought my uh, my power to me. Okay, yeah, and, you know, and it was just it was hearing that story where it's like myself putting myself in that situation, just thinking about you know, like even just the the fact of taking the flight and going over, you know, like I'm just very kind of not I wouldn't even say OCD, I guess, but. I'm, I'm very, you know, I have to have things kind of planned and organized and what times and, you know, so just hearing, you know, kind of going and being like, fuck it, I'm going to go do it. You know, that was kind of a, a scary thing. But, you know, ultimately, I, I feel like maybe even the situation that you were in beforehand kind of, you know, pushed you into, uh, you know, a, a mindset where you're like, you know, what, I just have to do this. And that's where some of the comfort come from. 100%. Hi, Lindsay. I see you wearing your Epre FML merch right now. I love it. Um, I, I definitely, like you said, I'm a crazy planner. Like my friends make fun of me because like, hey, next weekend. And they're like, it's Monday. Like what? <laughs> right. And my boyfriend, I'll be like, what are we having for dinner tomorrow night? He's like, we're having breakfast right now. Like, what are you talking about? Um, <laughs> It was totally outside of my, my norm and my comfort zone, but it really was so divinely how it was supposed to be because it changed me as a person. It forced me to not have plans and not know where I was going. So when I was on that trip, I, when I was in London, I was like, okay, where should, where should I go next? Maybe uh, uh, Amsterdam. And then I got on a plane and went. Um, and I didn't, know where I was going after that until I was in Amsterdam. So it was very much like flying by the seat of my pants. But that's what's so epic about solo travel is that like you don't have to plan. You don't have to have any set schedule on where you're going. And it's so much better so much so, uh, so many of the times because, you know, you'll meet people and they'll be like, oh, we're going here and you can just go. I met I met a guy randomly. Um, on the streets of the red light district. This sounds so bad taken out of context. <laughs> uh, a friendly guy. Um, and we all hung out <laughs> by the end of the night. He was like, Hey, we're uh, I'm in, the house in two weeks. Do you want to come? And I ended up going and we met in Mekin, like had this like awesome time, like getting to know each other. And he's still a good friend of mine. Um, mm. And you can't do that if you're traveling around with people or you have like set plans and, you know, planned your tickets everywhere. So there's something that's really special in in the unknown and just being like, whatever, I'm going to go. Here we go. <laughs> right. You know, and, and with studying and kind of looking, researching into the book, too, I, I feel like, you know, generally somebody looking at the cover might think like, oh, this is going to be a chick book. Like, I have to be a lady to, to read this book. As far as the guys that are reading it and that are looking into this as well, I think there's the intrigue behind like, A, this person just went and they fucking traveled a bunch of places by themselves like for me for instance you know like that sounds terrifying even in and of itself you know or just the fact of like kind of making those decisions and kind of well how did she plan this was it scary was it you know were there things that happened that she felt nervous about herself and just hearing you know d the different stories that you you know you've mentioned as far as like it was great you know and especially in a time right now where in america 
things are very divided and, you know, there's still, you know, kind of this really unfortunate hate that's happening. It's beautiful for people to be able to go to some other completely out of ordinary place and find people that are willing to help and that are kind, you know, it's, it's very intriguing and inspiring for sure. Yeah, you know, I have a lot of male readers and I love my male readers because it's always this like totally different perspective. Um, but grief and heartbreak are universal, you know, like you don't have to mm -hmm. be a to have gone through that. Um, everyone has right. gone through that on some level in some capacity. And um, mm -hmm. you know, the men, the or the book is not by any means being like, F men, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, I got my heart broken. Yeah, both of them had penises. But like that, it's, you know, <laughs> I, I yeah, love right. um, and I do not categorize all of them uh, in the same boat as I do the two that broke, uh, broke my heart. Um, but it, it really is. It, it's a chance for people to get on a plane and go to Europe with me. And I think that's why, especially in quarantine, so many people have been really deeply resonating with it because they're like, oh, my God, it's an escape. Um, yeah, yeah. And is you know it's as much as it is this like ridiculous netflix style story that you're you're going on with me it really is a healing you know it's you're mm -hmm. healing and doing the work along with me uh and i think that's why it's it's been as successful as it has been because it's it's been this fun crazy journey for people to immerse themselves in but they're also like healing along the way which is a big thing yeah, sure, sure. Uh, you know, and it, it just as far as maybe hitting on, on a little bit of a juxtaposition from that, do you have any stories from your travels that, you know, you could have made into a horror movie? Like every one, dude. <laughs> <laughs> my my ex-husband alone could be a horror trilogy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, okay. Touché. But no, um, yeah, so, I mean, I look, I felt really safe, um, almost everywhere I was at. Uh, the only time that there was a sketchy moment that happened was when I was in Paris. And um, my hostel was in like the kind of sketchier part of Paris. Paris to me just is overly romanticized and was probably the least favorite place I went to. The Eiffel Tower and the sights are amazing, but like city in general, like it wasn't my favorite. And the oh, first okay. night there, I was walking around and was wanting to like go and find a little cafe. And I bumped into this random you know smaller guy on the on the street and he was so nice and was like oh my god are you from america and blah 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 and we started chatting and he's like let me let me walk you around and he was he was small like i could have taken him so it didn't feel threatening um and i for whatever reason looking back on it i'm like this is a total not smart situation started walking with him and he ended up being weird um and oh no a little questionable and eventually i realized that he had walked me into the drug dealing section of paris oh shit and where he was on a first name basis with everyone and i was like okay this uh. is this not the greatest situation um so yeah i mean that's the perfect start to a horror film <laughs> yeah exactly called hostile <laughs> yeah right right and, and that's a, that was like kind of one of the first things i was wondering was like before you know i get into reading this book i'm like man i wonder if she ran into any of that shit like that movie alone was something that you know like that's something with horror too sometimes is you see certain things that you never even thought of like traveling countries and the next thing you know you're in some sort of like torture chamber you're like oh man yeah dude terrifying no. When I was on the plane, that's the only thing I knew about hostels. <laughs> right. And people get brutally murdered in it. Um, I, you know, and obviously hostels are amazing and um, right. they're like adult summer camps and I have such great memories at all of them. But like, that was my only knowledge of them. So yeah, I was right. definitely, um, for me, it's like, as long as you're aware of your surroundings and you're being smart, um, just as you would in any city, um, then you're, you're usually okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. With, with writing the book, um, you know, what did acting and writing and directing in film, how did that assist in your position as far as, you know, writing a book? That's a good question. Um, I think just being able to bear my soul. Um, I, when I wrote the book, my mom read it in its like rough draft, you know, first stage. And I remember her looking at me and being like, oh, Gabrielle. 
are you sure you don't want to change your name? Are you sure you don't want to like take this out? And it, it really was because I grew up as an actress and able to go on in a, on a set in front of hundreds of people and like completely break down and cry and like bare my soul to the entire, you know, cast and crew. Um, and because I was so in touch with my emotions because of my acting work, um, I think that played a really big role into me being able to authentically just like put it all out there. Uh, mm -hmm. And as far as directing, you know, I, I had no idea what I, I, I didn't like Google how to write a book or, you know, I didn't take classes for it. I took a creative writing class in my junior year of, of high school. Um, and that's about it. And I think because of the way my brain works, um, in directing where I'm able to like craft a story and know exactly how I think it should look that translated into the fact that I just sat down and wrote a book without having any idea how to really do that. Um, oh, okay. So crossed over in a lot of ways. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's one of those things. I mean, as far as I, it could, I, I think it could go both ways as far as, you know, being difficult with it being such a different world. But uh, I wanted to ask just because, you know, those things kind of go hand in hand as far as with preparation and, and, uh, you know, just allotting the time to, you know, going over things and making sure that they're right. Absolutely. And it's an art form, you know, it's all under the same umbrella of um, expressive art. Sure. Okay. Lastly, let me ask you as far as for the men out there that are reading Eat, Pray, FML, Tell us, you know, what would you like us to take from it or possibly learn from Eat, Pray, FML? You know, it's not something where, like, oh, I hope men read this and, you know, realize what they do. Yeah, no, no, I don't mean that. Like, no, I know. But, like, a lot, I'm sure there's men that, that do think that. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want that whatsoever. I mean, if you can, if you can see things in it that you recognize you do in yourself that you want to shift, I think that's great. Um, mm. As, as I say that for women too, um, I think it's more of a, anyone reading this book, whether you're male or female, what I would want them to take is that everything happens for a reason. Um, there is hope and there is a light at the end of the tunnel um, and that there are ways that you can help yourself heal. Um, there are experiences you can have that will help drive that forward and it can be sad and heartbreaking and fun and amazing and all of the things rolled into one because that's what makes us human. Oh, yeah, that's that's beautiful. <laughs> That's, I mean, uh, <laughs> that wraps it all up in the, in the, in the one, one answer there. Yeah. Great. Wow. That, that, that's awesome. Yeah. And like I say, you know, even mentioned earlier, you know, I mean, by no means, you know, after looking further into it and I'll be buying it, my wife and I are going to be reading it and everything like that here as soon as I get it. Uh, you know, but as far as, you know, it's not one of those things where it's just meant to bash on men and it's meant to, you know, no. completely trash or anything like that. So I, I didn't want it to seem like that if it seemed like that earlier, you know, just as far as no. to clarify. Not at all. You didn't make it seem like that. I just know that sometimes guys assume that that's what it is. And that's not at all. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a little bit of bashing on my ex-husband, but it's warranted, you know, yeah. like it's <laughs> right. facts. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, there's, and even with the, the guy, the guy who dumped me before Europe, which is the one that actually broke my heart. Um, he, you know, I wrote this book when I was still very much in love with him. So it's, it's all taken with, I think some of my female readers would say almost maybe too much care um, on his end. And it, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with, with fuck men and this and this. It's, it's really about my personal journey to figure out how the hell to love myself and, you know, the crazy things that happened along the way and inviting people to take that wild adventure around the world with me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Grow and learn from it and move on. Yep, that's all you can do in this life. <laughs> beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Look, this is wrapping up our interview. This has been absolutely amazing, Gabrielle. Uh, I do have one more finale question for you. Uh, it's going to be kind of silly, but first and foremost, I just wanted to, you know, give you this time to let everybody know what you have going on, you know, as far as like the book, what 2021 may be bringing to uh, readers or viewers. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have no idea what 2021 is going to bring. Um, I'm writing the second book, the sequel to Eat, Pray, FML. I have no idea when that'll be out, um, but I am writing it. And uh, so I'm working on that. And it, as far as acting right now, it's so weird um, with COVID and everything. Our industry is starting to like come back and, and get moving. Um, but we're, I'm pitching a couple, a couple things, uh, directing, producing wise. And, um, uh, I shot a, a film with Scout Compton where we play sisters. Um, so that'll probably be out sometime later this year. And, uh, you know, just taking it as it comes, seeing what, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't know, I'll probably be making something in a month. Who knows? <laughs> Right. I mean, and it, it's, it's, you know, fun having the writing and the, the, the acting in the film industry, you know, as far as with that too, because lots of projects I'm sure that pop up and uh, there's probably, you know, some sort, I think I've, I've heard you mention, you know, kind of sorting through different things and, and, you know, taking your time on picking the right projects. Yeah. And, you know, you get to a point in your career where it's like, you don't just take everything that comes in and you, you're wanting to put your energy towards specific things. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I've been really, really blessed with the book doing as well as it has um, because it's given me space to not feel pressured to work all the time. Um, okay. I'm a lot more selective on the, the projects that I do and um, the things that I want to put my energy towards. And I'm really thankful that I've had that opportunity because it's an industry where you don't have that all of the time. Um, yeah. So it's been really great to be able to, to pick and choose what I really think is worth worth doing. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Very, very cool. All right. Well, look, this is uh, bringing us to our finale. So this is kind of a silly one. You're, you're going to have to bear with me here. It's kind of goofy. Uh, it's a little bit of a, of a hypothetical situation. So we'll say, you know, after the success of Eat, Pray, FML comes out, you're going and you're meeting with publishers and they're going over maybe some titles for your sequel of the book. And they're absolutely terrible, you know, and they're trying to pitch, you know, what the idea would come with. So I'm going to give you three different acronyms. This, this is, this is a, a little, a little a, a spot that I call eat, pray, hashtag acronym. So I'm going to give you three different silly acronyms that me being in my thirties had no idea what the fuck they even meant. First of all. So I might have to tell you, cause I didn't know what half of these, but so, for the first one, I just wanted to ask you what the book would be about if your sequel was Eat, Pray, N-A-G, which is not a good idea. Have you ever heard of that? No. <laughs> uh, I said this what would that book be about? This even makes me feel, feel old because I don't know what half the, the lingo is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, say it again, not a N-A-G-I, not a good idea. Yeah, I've never heard that. Um, yeah. um, that I mean, like half of the stuff that's probably in book two. I'm always, <laughs> yeah. always being like, "This is not a great idea. This is a questionable decision." Um, but it's always in those those things that make me end up like learning a lesson and you know having really good shit to write about. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, all right, I love it. Okay, so the the, the publishers come back and they say, "Okay, we're not going to use that one." The second idea would be eat, pray, hashtag. P911. That is for parent alert. Have you ever heard that one? Parent alert? Parent alert. I guess it's maybe like if you're doing some bad shit on a computer and your parents walk in. I, oh. I don't know. <laughs> These are real, too, if that's believable. Wow. Um, I, would, <laughs> I, would say, I would say no, because my mom and I literally know everything about each other. So there's nothing yeah. to her, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I know. Gabrielle did that. That's not surprising. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I've listened to some of your, you know, like your, your podcast that your mom had on recently. I'm just like, holy moly, the, oh the relationship God. between my mom and I, holy shit. <laughs> that's, that's what's going on in 2021. I have a, I was forced into doing a podcast, which now I'm <laughs> happy that I'm doing because it's become this like awesome outlet that I get to, to do every week um, because we're in quarantine and what the hell else are we doing? So it's been <laughs> right that <laughs> yeah that is awesome that is awesome all right so now for the last one for the last silly eat pray acronym we're gonna go with eat pray i i r c which if i remember correctly this is these are all uh, things 
Okay, interesting. I mean, why can't people just spell these out? But okay. right, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I that's valid because you know I I've had my drunken nights, uh, <laughs> and also it it makes a little bit of sense because the second book spans from when I get off the plane from Europe all the way to December of 2019. So it's like two years of time that I'm going wow. back and writing about. So it's, there's been some times where I'm writing and I'm like, okay, that conversation with this person, was that before this happened? And what exactly was said? And it's it's been challenging for me. Right. Uh, for <laughs> as it was happening. So it was a lot more, you know, it was easier to just sit down and like write about exactly what was being said verbatim. Um, mm -hmm. So that one actually makes a little bit of sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. I, you know, it was just the, it was the thing of the FML and looking into different acronyms online yeah. and half the stuff I'm like, this may, oh, first of all, why don't they just spell this out? But right. then, you know, like you said, and then, you know, second, it's like, I don't know why these even exist, but uh, we'll make uh, some fun out of it. Shit. Why not? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been our time, Gabrielle. Thank you so, so much. This has been absolutely amazing. Uh, everybody check out her book, her podcast, uh, movie shorts, if you haven't already. Uh, and your future endeavors, I look forward to as well, Gabrielle. Thanks, dude. This was such a great interview. I appreciate it. Not a problem. Thank you so much. Bye, this is going to end it off. Lo-Fi Horror Guy, Gabrielle Stone. You guys take care. Be safe. Bye. Bye-bye. He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, lo-fi horror guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience.